in this uh, topic, we're going to be talking about climate and the effects that it have and where it's located. Here's a map of the Earth where we have a certain uh, climate classification system going on here. And you can probably tell by looking at these different colors that the purplish colors are tropical areas, uh, things that you would find, for example, in South America and in Africa. We would sort of expect that. The orangey colors are dry deserts. And so we see most of Australia is a desert. We have deserts in North Africa, South Africa, uh, of course, over here in the Arabian Peninsula. And we have a desert over here in, in uh, Southwest United States. Uh, the greens represent temperate uh, climates which are kind of moderate or in between and so famous places like this are places like Europe here and the eastern United States uh, and just a little bit on the coast of uh, Australia here. The blue is the one that we're kind of familiar with. These are the colder climates that you see in an awful lot of Canada, uh, an awful lot, for example, in northern Asia or Russia. And then we have, you know, darn right cold, which is the polar region shown here in gray. And by climate, of course, we mean long term. We mean this is typically what these places are like. Uh, when we talk about weather, we're talking about what's just happening today. Climate, of course, can affect all sorts of things. Uh, I mean, if you're a Canadian over here, you, you better be used to shoveling snow because that's what you're going to get. That's the climate we have in Canada. We have the four seasons and you're going to get winter. Uh, but of course, climate affects all sorts of things like the vegetation you see in this forest. Now, over here is a, uh, a photograph of, uh, of Uluru or Ayers Rock in central Australia. Very, very dry, very, very hot. And of course, some places have nice sandy beaches, warm seas and, and uh, coconut trees growing. It affects your transportation and your clothing. I mean, for example, we can see here how uh, certain people have, you know, domesticated the camel to take care of their transportation needs, whereas in other places we've domesticated the dog to do our transportation for us. And as you can probably guess, uh, these won't work in other locations. Like, I don't think a camel would do too well uh, going to the North Pole, nor for that matter would a Siberian husky do particularly well in a, in a very, very hot uh, desert either. Certainly it affects your housing. If you're going to build a house in Canada, you better make sure it's got uh, thick walls and good insulation because you're going to lose a lot of heat. We can see that this house is uh, holding on to its heat quite nicely because the snow is staying on the roof and not melting. If the snow melts on the roof, we know that the heat's escaping the house and melting the snow. So have a nice thick blanket on our, on our house means our insulation is working. Whereas in a place down here like uh, Queensland, Australia, you don't need those thick walls. Uh, in fact, you need uh, perhaps instead a, a strong steel roof to reflect the heat from the sun and try to keep you cool. Things like verandas and lots of screen doors and windows. And of course in other tropical countries they've even simplified it even further. What we really need is a bit of shade to keep the sun off of us and a little platform to keep us uh, off the bugs and the sand. Animals are adapted as well. Over here we see muskox adapted to a, a cold northern climate. And over here we see a picture of what's called the, the thorny devil, which you would find again in, uh, in central Australia. We have tropical birds like the toucan, and we have Antarctic birds like the penguin. So we can say that animals are definitely adapted to their particular environment or the climate that exists where they live. And that tells you that the climate there has been like that for a, a very, very long time, which allows these animals to uh, go through biological evolution and adapt to that area. Of course, plants are no exception. And so we can see here, for example, in a desert, we have cacti who are specially adapted to store water for long periods of drought. Uh, sometimes we can have uh, massive rainforests. So here we see a person walking through the giant redwoods uh, of the coast of California. And uh, the lush rainfall that happens here, of course, promotes a lot of growth. We've got lots of ferns growing. And speaking of ferns, down here in places like Australia, New Zealand, you can actually see plants called tree ferns. These are massive, great big uh, ferns, you might say. Um, and in Africa we have an interesting tree. This is the uh, the baobab tree and you can probably tell by its huge trunk that what he does is store lots and lots of water uh, for those days when it gets really really dry in that climate. So if we're going to investigate uh, climate change in this unit then we need to understand a couple of terms. Uh, and again as I said by weather we mean short-term conditions for example what's the weather like today and it changes day by day and that's why we watch the forecast uh, the weather forecast on the news whereas in climate we're talking about long term we're talking about a condition that is measured over many 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 years now we're going to be looking at some evidence with regards to climate change and we need to be able to understand the two kinds of categories of evidence that we have
Well, one type of evidence we gather is called anecdotal. And what we mean by anecdotal is we're getting reports from actual people. So, for example, we could interview various Aboriginal elders who would report changes in animal migration. So we might have had, for example, Inuit elders who have noticed that the migration of caribou herds has changed slightly over the years in their, in their oral traditions that are passed down from generation to generation. Uh, farmers might report to us that uh, they've noticed that there's changes in the growing season, that they either have to plant or harvest their crops earlier or later, and uh, they notice it's different. The other kind of data we collect, of course, is scientific data. And this is where we actually use instruments to collect and record information about climate. So here we see a weather instrument uh, station in the Arctic. Um, and this data can later be processed by computers to give us long-term trends and make predictions.